each of you out this morning. Okay, we're going to be in Acts chapter 17 this morning, so feel free to take your Bibles and turn over to there. Anyone remember from last week what we studied last week? Anyone want to maybe shout it out or lift your hand up? Doug? Crowns. Crowns, okay. Crowns that are awarded to just anybody? No? To the saved. To the saved? And does every saved person receive a crown? No, they're uh, earned. So we talked about the, the uh, anyone remember how many crowns are actually talked about in the Word of God? I just gave, actually five. Five. I said, I'm like, how many crowns? And I'm like, giving you the, the answer. I'm an easy teacher, right? There are five crowns. Now, uh, four, actually, whoever said four, there were several of you. One of the crowns is reserved for uh, pastors, faithful pastors. So uh, not all of us can be pastors. Um, in fact, half of us here this morning are disqualified at birth <laughs> from ever being a pastor. Uh, and then the rest of us, and that's of course, um, uh, well, the rest of us, of course, the Lord has to call you to be a pastor. So, uh, But there is a crown uh, for pastors, those that have served as a pastor faithfully or been a shepherd. Um, One of the crowns we looked at last week was called the crown of rejoicing, which dealt with uh, soul winning. It's a crown that you'll remember uh, given to soul winners. And what is soul soul winning? Well, it's telling others about Jesus. That's what soul winning is, or uh, telling others about Jesus. You understand The crown of rejoicing, something given to soul winners, it's not Jesus saying, okay, how many people did you lead to Christ? Oh, okay, Josie, you you have ten. Wow. All right, and Tom, oh, well, you only got five, so your crown's not going to be quite as good as Josie's. That's not what the Bible tells us. In fact, the Bible doesn't say you actually need to lead a person to Christ and and maybe be there as they pray and give their their life and ask Jesus to forgive them of their sins. That's not what soul winning is. Soul winning is telling others about Jesus. Okay? With the the hope, of course, that they decide to trust Jesus with their soul and winning people to Christ. We talked about the crown of rejoicing. Well, this morning I want to uh, I want us just to look at um, winning at soul winning. <laughs> and you ever uh, maybe played a game um, where it was a hundred percent guaranteed success rate? When I think of games like that, I think of like carnival games. Now some some are pretty good at these carnival games. Have you ever been to maybe a carnival and uh, the the man? Uh, at the game is saying, everyone's a winner, everyone's a winner. 100% su- success rate. Now, is that, is that true? Uh, is everyone going to get that big stuffed animal that you want so badly during the car? <laughs> Mike's nodding his head. I've heard he's pretty good at carnival <laughs> games, actually. He, he, it's the reason why they're no longer coming to the Washington County Fair. He wipes them out. They lose money. No. Of course, everyone is a winner, but not everyone gets that big teddy bear or that prize. Uh, They may get something uh, of lesser value. I remember once going uh, shopping. um, Well, I was with my wife. We were shopping maybe as a family, and uh, we were in Fred Meyer. And we're going around, and guys, I mean, how many enjoy uh, grocery shopping and doing all of that? It's It's not too bad. I don't mind it. But, you know, some days you just don't feel like spending an hour walking every aisle. And there was, and this was the Fred Meyer over uh, off of Cornelius Pass. I remember there was, um, it was probably a Saturday, they had this person doing a promotion. And he was going around telling everyone, uh, uh, showing them this, I forget what kind of cleaning product it was. But it actually was kind of interesting. Um, And he's like, if you come and watch the presentation, watch my demo, you will leave 
with, uh, everyone will leave with a, a prize, with a, a sample, whether or not you buy it or not. I had no intentions of buying it. Have, have any of you been, maybe, I, I've seen this before. I've, I've fell for it once. But you go and, you know, I had nothing better to do other than just push the trolley along. So I said, okay, I'm going to go. I think I took one of my kids. And we stood there. And quickly we realized, oh boy, this is, you know, what, what are we going to get? And you're thinking you're going to get a sample of this cleaning product. And I, I forget what it was, but it was actually kind of interesting. You're like, wow, but I don't want to spend the $75. Uh, that it was, it was some pretty high amount. Well, everyone was a winner. At the end of 10 minutes, everyone was a winner. And I think what he handed out was one of those... Um, microfiber things that you clean your glasses with, which are, you get for free when you get a new pair of glasses. I was like, this is garbage. 100% success rate, okay? We're talking about soul winning here this morning. And, you know, and one of the prizes or awards to soul winning, telling others about Jesus, introducing them to Jesus, is a crown of rejoicing. You're not going to get a little microfiber thing to clean your cell phone or glasses with. You're going to get a crown of rejoicing. And so um, one of the, of the very familiar verses in the Word of God that deals with soul winning or talks about the person who uh, makes the decision to tell others about Christ is actually found in Proverbs 11, verse 30, which it says this. It says, He that winneth souls is wise. You're wise if you decide to win souls, if you tell others about Jesus Christ. And, you know, in order to believe this verse, you really have to receive it with faith. And that's going to require that you believe God's word. Do you believe God's word when it says, he that winneth souls is wise? Do you believe that the Bible is true? You have to believe it, but you also have to be willing to act upon it. That's what faith is. Faith is believing God's word, but then also acting upon it, showing that you believe, making a commitment. And in the matter of soul winning, it's making a commitment to uh, lead people to Christ, to lead a soul to Christ. Maybe it's telling somebody about it. Maybe it's writing the name down and uh and just praying for that name that God will give you a, a time where you can, uh, you can tell them about Christ. Would you be willing to do that? That's what I want us to think about. You know, it's easy to dismiss a challenge like that. All, I would say most Christians, they want to tell others about Christ. Um, you know, if, they're, if you're saved, you, you want to do that. You, because why... Of course, there's, there's rewards, there's prizes, there's a crown of rejoicing. But it's very easy to start thinking of reasons why I can't do it. Oh, well, maybe pastor can do that. Maybe pastor uh, can tell somebody about Jesus, or maybe Josh can, or maybe... But it's easy to think of reasons why you can't, or why I can't tell somebody who Jesus is. So today, I, I want us just to... I want to point out some things for us to consider regarding soul winning, and specifically winning at soul winning, okay? Winning, telling others about Jesus Christ and what he has done for them. And so if you're in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17, in verse 22, I just want to begin reading here in verse 22, and I'm just going to go ahead and continue down to the end of the chapter. But the Bible tells us here in Acts chapter 17, verse number 22, tells us of Paul here, a time when Paul was by himself. It says, then the, it says this, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that, ye, uh, that in all things ye are too superstitious. For I passed by and beheld your devotions. I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. Whom ye therefore, or whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, 
dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he, he needeth anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Verse 28, For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain as of our own poets have said, for we are, all, we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art of man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commendeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit, the last verse, howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, among the which was Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Dam Damaris, and others with them. And so um, here we read about a passage of time when Paul is, is addressing a group of men here in Athens. And, um, you know, we're going we're gonna to look at this passage here in just a minute, but winning at soul winning. You know, no doubt one of the greatest hindrances to personal soul winning that I think we all have to, we all maybe struggle with, we all deal with, is, is that of fear. That is a great uh, hindrance for many people, fear. Whether it's the fear of people, the fear of people could be talking with people, uh, whatever, not understanding how they're going to react. The book of Proverbs, tw verse uh, 29, excuse me, chapter 29, verse 25, tells us this about fear or fearing other people. It says, the fear of man bringeth a snare or a trap. It's a trap. Fearing man, it's a trap, it bringeth a snare. But whosoever putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. So fearing what, uh, what man may think, fearing other people when it comes to the things of God, it's a trap, it's, it's a tactic of, of the devil. The devil wants you to, to fear what others will say, especially as it relates to sharing the gospel. We've got to get over this fear. Got to get over it. Realize God is the one that's in control. Realize that the people that need to hear about Jesus, they are souls for whom Christ died. Christ died for their soul, just like he died for your soul and he died for my soul. They need to hear about God. They need to hear about Christ. There is one thing, though, that we should fear. In, in the book of Jude, verse 22, again, this is, this is talking about really uh, sharing the gospel, soul winning, having compassion for others. It says, and, and of some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. You know, having uh, the the... the the type of fear that does motivate, the understanding where people are, are destined to go, where they are headed to go, hell, an eternity, punishment. Our text uh, back in Acts talked about how one day, verse 31, it is appointed a day in which He, Jesus Christ, is going to judge the world in righteousness. He's going to judge the world. All of us are going to stand before the throne of God. And last week we talked about that as the Christian when we uh, 
uh, John, his, he was given that revelation of what it's going to be like at the rapture, what it's going to be like for the Christian. We're going to be taken up and we're going to be before the throne, room of, uh, throne of God. And we're going to be judged based on our works. But do you understand today, the lost person, there's a different judgment for them. It's one we're not going to be, if you're saved, you're not going to be a part of. Their judgment, oh, they will stand before Jesus Christ, but He's going to judge them, the world in righteousness. And there is an eternity, uh, and there's punishment that awaits them. You know, the fear of people and what they may think, it's a legitimate fear that we may have. There's the fear, fear of failure, too. The, we're talking about hindrances to soul winning, hindrances to telling somebody about Jesus, the fear of failure. Well, what if they reject? None of us like to be rejected. I think nobody enjoys rejection. There is the fear of rejection or the fear that I may try this and, and be turned down. And so let me ask you a question this morning. Let me ask you a question. If you could be guaranteed that every sincere effort to personally present the gospel would be successful, would you try it? If I could tell you, you've got these fears, fear what people are going to say, what they're going to think, fear of rejection. If I could tell you that if you could be guaranteed that if you share the gospel, you would be successful in sharing the gospel, would you do it? If I said there's a 100% success rate, <laughs> would you trust me now? Now, you, if you're trusting me, <laughs> don't trust me. But think about that. You know, our lesson here this morning, the message I want to give you is, I, I want to give you some things to think about that will increase your boldness for Christ. Increase my boldness for Christ. Before I do so, let's notice a few things from the scripture that we just read. So look back here in Acts chapter number 17. Now, of course, Paul here at this time, he is in Athens. And if you know the narrative, if you know the story, Paul is actually waiting for his partners to come and join him. And, you know, Athens, there's a lot of similarities to the city of Athens here uh, to uh, probably America today. First of all, if you just flip back, I have to turn back a page, but to page 16. Notice this was a city, Athens, back in the day of Paul, much similar to what we could say the United States of America is like today. Verse 16, you can see it was a city that was given to idolatry. And Paul uh, or the Bible tells us in verse 16 of Acts chapter 17. It says, Now while Paul waited for them in Athens, waited for his partners his, to come and join him, the Bible says his spirit was stirred in him, and he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Of course, idolatry, you understand what that is. When we talk about idols, really an idol is anything that is placed before God. We all have idols in our life. It could be different for each one of us, but it's anything that comes before God. You understand the people here in Athens, their focus was not on God. And just like America today, most Americans, their focus is not on God. They have other things before God. But we also see that Athens, look in the next verse, verse 17, they were also very religious um, they, this was a city full of religion. And America today is steeped in religion. We have every type of religion going on. Many, they have meet people meeting today in, uh, in, uh, in various places. Some meet, you know, America is full of religion. Look in verse 17. Athens was full of religion. Goes on, therefore, Paul said he was disputing with them in the synagogues, so the Jews. And it says, and with devout persons. You know who, who are devout people? 
when you use the word devout, usually it's in reference to someone following a religion, maybe a devout Catholic. Or you use that as an adjective to describe someone who's very religious. Paul was reasoning with the Jews and the synagogues and with devout persons, the Bible says. Athens was given to idolatry. Think they were, you know, uh, whether that was religion, whether it was other things, anything that was in the place of God. They were also dominated by philosophies, and boy, do we have philosophies today in America. There was in verse 18 and verse 21, look, you've got the Epicureans, you've got the Stoics it talks about, and if you know anything about them, they were philosophers, reasoning day and night. Verse um, 21, it says this, for the Athenians and strangers which uh, which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new things. So they were constantly coming up with new philosophies. And perhaps the most obvious and most important of all, they were ignorant of the one true living God. Look in verse 23. We read this verse. Paul calls it out like it is. He says to them, he found an altar to the unknown God. In the very end of verse 23, he says, Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. See, they're following their idols. Their sports, their religion, their, uh, their pleasure, whatever it is, things that they put before God, they were dominated by philosophies, just like many today in America, steeped in religion, yet ignorant that there's a true God out there, a true and living God. Could this not also describe the country we live in? the city we live in. And so Paul took the opportunity to give them the truth. Paul took this opportunity as he's waiting for his partners to join him. He took the opportunity to give them the gospel. I want you to see, first of all, the, the three things Paul didn't do. Notice this, and go back to verse 16 and 17. Paul did not get mad at them for their sin. Now, that would have been something very easy for him. He's looking out at the city. He saw the city wholly given to idolatry. And you didn't see Paul getting on. Uh, and if you know the word of God, read the book of Acts. You can really learn the personality of Paul. Um, I would describe him as a man who is not always the easiest to get along with. Certainly not the easiest to, um, to work with. The, you know, Barnabas, we know he had patience. And he had patience because, and he believed in Paul before anyone believed in him. Who was Paul before he became Paul? He was Saul, a murderer, vicious, a persecutor. And so Paul was... Um, I, I, could, I could see, I could, I'm going out on a limb here, there's no, no scripture to, to back this up, but if you were to say, what was Paul like? What was his personality? I could see him as being kind of, he was a strong leader, we do know that, but I could see him kind of being a little bit of a hothead, maybe. Um, very, uh, maybe explosive, I don't know the right term. But you see here, he's looking and he's waiting for them. And the Bible says the spirit was stirred in him. And you don't see him getting mad at everyone and start calling out, you know, just belittling them, calling out, calling sin, sin, and, and sin, you know, telling them they're all going to hell. You don't see him doing that. What do you see? You see him engaging in a conversation. He disputed with them. He began to talk to them. He didn't get mad at them. It's so easy for uh, you and I today as we look out and maybe you come in contact to just get mad at the way someone's living. 
you, you also see Paul not waiting to build a relationship. He was speaking to strangers here. He wasn't waiting for the partners to come and say, well, you know what, um, I'm going to wait until I have reinforcements. No, he didn't wait to build a relationship. He just started doing that. You also don't see Paul invite anyone to church, <laughs> right? You say, well, you know, inviting people to church is a good thing. Yeah, you don't see him doing that. You see him uh, starting a conversation with them. Paul went, and we know this is the case, this was his pattern, when he entered into a city, he went to where the sinners were. And he went to the synagogues first, the Bible tells us. He went to the synagogues, he went to the marketplaces, he went uh, to the temples of wisdom, he went to where the sinners were. You say, well, hang on, Josh, did you say, is inviting a lost person to church a bad idea? Is inviting someone to church a good idea? The answer is yes, if they will come. But, but you have to understand, when you invite someone to church, what you're doing is you're asking, let's say it's a lost person. When you're inviting a lost person to church, you are inviting a sinner to come to the light. Look uh, in John chapter, um, John chapter 3, in verse 20, sorry, I didn't throw this verse up there. This is the John uh, chapter 3, verse number 20. This is the reason why most people you invite to church do not come. It's because what you're doing is you're asking a lost person to come to the light. Listen, as the, John says this, John, or um, actually, I believe Jesus is speaking here. Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 20, it says, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Now, doesn't that make sense? Lost people, they don't inherently want to come to church because they know it's going to reveal uh, the light is going to reveal their deeds. So when you say, well, soul winning is inviting people to church. No, it's not. That's not soul winning. You actually, in the book of Acts, you don't find inviting sinners to church in the book of Acts. The fact is, soul winning is going to where the sinners are and telling them about Jesus Christ. That is what soul winning is. It's telling others about Jesus Christ. Remember, wisdom is wisdom's the ability to think and to act with the mind of Christ. Jesus, you, you know when we read about the Lord Jesus when he was on earth, Jesus sat and ate with the publicans and sinners. Jesus talked with that immoral woman at Jacob's well, did he not? He spoke with her. He engaged in a conversation with her. You didn't see Jesus saying, well, I'm going to invite you to one of my services. No, he engaged with them right where they were at. That's what Paul is doing here. You know, we've got to guard against becoming too uh, respectable. Or, you know, and, and I know there's some common sense here. Um, you know, and I know, um, you know, would you give the gospel, uh, you, you know, to uh, maybe someone who lives a homosexual lifestyle? The Bible would call them a sodomite. Would you give the gospel? Would you tell somebody like that about Jesus? We've got to guard against becoming too respectful. Well, no, I'm not going to go to them. I'm not going to tell them. What about a drug addict? Someone who has abused their, their bodies with drugs or their body with drugs. Would you, would you tell them about Jesus? Most of us, and I'm going to throw my, my name in the hat there, most of us would rather pass by the other side. But you have to understand, we have to understand, these are souls that are created in the image and likeness of God. God created them just like he created 
you and I. They're special to Jesus Christ. You see, nothing God does is, um, He didn't design something for ruin. I mean, you know, that's where a lot of people are headed. They're headed for a, a ruin, a, an eternal um, ruin. God did not design anybody to go to hell. He didn't create hell for, uh, for people. He created it for the devil and his angels. So, I'm, you know, I'm not advocating, though, when I say this, that we ought to go to bars or go to casinos or, you know, go to certain areas in the street when we, where we, oh, we know the drug dealers are on this corner, so let's go there. That's not what I'm advocating. I think you've got to use some common sense here. But if God brings someone like that across your path, witness to him or her. Go ahead right there. Witness to them. Jude, uh, back to Jude here, um, I read verse 22. Look at the end of verse 23. You know, it says, and, and of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. The garment there is referring to, you know, the way that perhaps they look, the way that their lifestyle you know, um, and so getting back to our question, how do you win at soul winning? How do you win? When you engage in a spiritual conversation with someone, what are the possible outcomes? Let's think about this real quickly. When you engage in a, in a spiritual conversation with someone, understanding what soul winning is, is simply telling them about Jesus, maybe telling them what Jesus did for for them or for you. And when you engage in a spiritual conversation, what are, what's the possible outcomes? Well, I'd say there are three. If you think about it, there really are only three possible outcomes. The first, of course, and what I would say if you're doing that, you're hoping for number one. Lead that person. You know, One of the outcomes is you could lead them to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That usually doesn't happen the first time, but it, it, it sometimes does. The second option or the second thing that could happen is maybe you leave them with something to think about. That is what the Bible calls planting a seed. You plant a seed and uh, then maybe someone else comes along and they water it. And, and uh, you know, God gives the increase. Or, and um, so... There's, you could lead them to Christ, you could, you could leave them with something to think about it, maybe plant a seed, or they could reject Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what we see happen to Paul in, in, uh, here when he was in Athens. In verse 32, you see that uh, verse 32, it says, some mocked Paul, and others said, so the mocking was the rejection, then uh, some others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. That's, that means, you know, they listened. A seed was planted in their heart, in their life. And then in verse 34, we see that certain men clave unto him and believed. They got saved. You see the same reactions. There's three possible outcomes. And we saw all three here in our text. And so what's the success rate? Maybe we talked about, if I could guarantee you that you could have 100% success when you witness, would you do it? Well, the success rate, as we just talked about here, obviously winning a soul to Christ, that's a good thing. That's success. Planting a seed, I would say that's a success as well. If you have, if God is able to use you to plant a seed in someone's life, then praise God for that. Rejection of the truth, well, that's not a good thing. That's a bad thing. And so, you know, just, just by going in it on your own here, engaging in the spiritual conversation, understand this, you go into it with the odds. Two out of three, a six, if you round up, 67%. Success rate, guaranteed, just based on the possible outcomes. 
Those are pretty good odds, right? Any math people out there? It's a pretty good success rate, right, Brian? The problem is, is that 33% is what so often defeats us, right, from telling others. We think, well, we're going to have the, the truth rejected. They're going to reject the truth. And so because of that, we don't even, um, we don't even engage in soul winning. Now, what if I could show you that how, how you, you could turn that 67% into 100%? Would you be interested? Would you reconsider? Well, the, if you, let me say this. If you are prepared to live by faith, your soul winning um, can be in a winning situation 100% of the time. Again, faith, the definition here, faith is believing God's word and acting upon what God says. And so let's see as we we're just, we're going to wrap up in two minutes. Let's see what God's word says. And as we read these verses, Understand, it may require an attitude adjustment on your part. It may require an attitude adjustment on our part based on the Word of God. We see here, if you are prepared to live by faith, soul winning, you'll have a, a when it comes to soul winning, there is a 100% success rate. And look here, we're going to read three verses and be done. In 1 Peter, oh, I was on 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 14. The Bible says, faith is believing, uh, it's, it's believing God's word and acting upon it. Okay? God's word says, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, maybe that's if you're rejected for the name of Christ, Maybe it's that fear of people, what they may say, what they may think, what your family may think about you. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, the Bible says, Happy are ye, for the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. So, do you want to glorify? We were created to bring glory and honor to God. One way, we, one way we do that is through telling other people about Him, telling other people about His Son. Oh, and it may bring reproach, but it's not reproach upon you. It's reproach upon God. Uh, or, um, the Bible says quite the, it's something different. On your part, He is glorified. Also, Luke chapter 6 and verse 22. Remember, faith is believing God's word and acting upon it. The Bible says, Blessed are ye when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company. You know, you may lose some friends. You may lose some family members when you live for Christ, when you tell others about them. They may say, you know what? This person's changed. They're talking about Jesus, and they may separate themselves from your company. But look on, believe God's word and act upon it. Goes on and says, and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. But in verse 23, rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy. Behold, your reward is great in heaven. What did we talk about last week? crown of rejoicing it's waiting for those and it says for in the like manner did their fathers under the prophets and so it's nothing new um, rejection uh, being losing friends because you're telling them about Christ or being a reproach for the for um, for uh, the name of God nothing new it's, uh, it's been going that way for a long time now, if you want a win-win situation, just take God at his word and be bold. And then one final verse here in Acts chapter 5, verse 41. This is um, 
talking about the apostles here, and it says, And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and every house, they ceased not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. They cease not. And so what I'm simply saying is you have, going into this, you have, when you soul win, when you tell somebody about Jesus, there's three possible outcomes. Two of them are very favorable. But when you take God's word and understand it and change your perspective and see it as God sees it, that's when I'm saying it, 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 um, it turns into a win-win situation. It's a cannot lose uh, situation, 100% success rate. And it all comes down to our focus, our focus. If life's all about you, you'll be very selective when it comes to soul winning, if you soul win at all. So tomorrow begins a new day a new uh, work week for many of us and a, a new retirement week for <laughs> most of us. Um, you know, maybe it's a week where you're going to, like I was saying, shopping. Maybe it's a week of shopping. Maybe you're going to come across someone who needs to hear the name of Jesus. Maybe you have an opportunity to, to speak up for Christ. Tell them about Jesus Christ. Understand this. Uh, take God at His word. And be bold. And this maybe this is the challenge that we all need to take um, this morning as we as we head into next week or this week to center our hearts on the souls of people, their everlasting souls that are going to spend eternity somewhere. And if you pray, God will bring someone into your life. If you pray, God will will lead you. Uh, to, to talk to someone. If that's your desire, God will give it to you. Make sure you, you have, um, and this is, um, many of you I know this, you, you have tracks somewhere accessible. Maybe they're in the car. Um, tracks that have the gospel on the back of them. Um, live with the right attitude. Lost people can detect compassion. Uh, they can... Uh, they can detect whether you're sincere or not. And be soul conscious. You can't lose. Um, a crown of rejoicing awaits those. Again, to earn that crown, you don't have to, it's not a list of, oh, you need to ha have won so many people. No. Soul winning is telling. There's different, you, you could be rejected. There are people who are going to get a crown of rejoicing that have never had the opportunity to see the fruit from the seeds that were planted. Maybe they just got nothing but rejection. But you see, when you put God's Word into focus and you, um, you understand what it says, you may feel, you may lose friends, you may feel the rejection, but on God's part, He's glorified. And um, so be soul conscious. Take opportunity to tell others, about how Jesus, who Jesus is, and engage in that spiritual conversation. And so that's our challenge here this morning, and I hope it was a challenge and a blessing to you. So you can be dismissed at this time.